Welcome back to Theology in Action. I'm Levi Hightree with Tony Caffey. How are you doing today? Hey, Levi. Yeah. So I want to start with a little bit of like a qualifying, I guess, kind of story about the topic, then we'll dig into the topic. Uh, going on mission trips, things like that, and talking with people, I've always I ran into and come to a realization that when you talk to someone, if you have the intent of evangelizing and you ask them, hey, do you believe in God or are you saved and kind of ask that question, Yes. Most of the time you get the answer <laughs> yes. And at one point in my life, I'm like, oh, awesome, great. And I can just accept that. And then you start to get, have a conversation. You're like, wait a second, we may be way apart. We talked about that with baptism. I think this is another one of those that, yeah. that we may be aiming at two different goals here. So let's, we're talking about salvation today. Let's, okay. let's define it. What is at the heart, at the very base of what's the gospel? What's salvation? Okay, well, those are two different questions. Sure, what is the sure. gospel? What is salvation? So let me maybe, let me make the issue more complicated, <laughs> okay. and then I'll hopefully try to resolve it. Because salvation as a term is used differently in the scriptures. Okay. We have the nature of what's called justification. Mm -hmm. We have sanctification. So there's a sense in which we are being saved, according to the scriptures. And then there's also glorification, which is our future salvation that still awaits as Christ returns. We get a new glorified body. So there, those are the three uh, presentations of salvation. I'll even complexify it further because there's also election, mm -hmm. Romans yeah. 8, you know, 1 Peter 1, uh, Ephesians 1, talk about us being saved, in a sense, chosen before the world was even created. But what you're asking is really that... that that issue of justification. Yeah. When yeah. is a person justified? And, you know, we're Protestant, so Martin Luther, one of the things that he said is that we're going to learn the doctrine of justification, we're going to teach it to people, and we're going to beat it into their heads constantly. <laughs> Your need to be justified, to yeah. be saved. And that takes place in response to what we call the gospel. So not the gospels, which are the record of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that tell about sure. Jesus, but the gospel, the good news of salvation. And the gospel, if I were to put it in its most simple form, is this. God created us. We rebelled against him. God, in his mercy, sent Jesus Christ, his son, to come and die for our sins. Our faith in Jesus' work on the cross and his resurrection is what saves us. That's how we're justified. And that's, that's the gospel, that's the good news, that's what we share with people around mm -hmm. the world or in San Antonio, wherever we are. We're sinners. you gotta get the, you got to get the bad news first before yeah. you get to the good news. The bad news is we're sinners, we're separated from God, we can't have a relationship with Him apart from Christ, we can't earn salvation or do enough good works to make up for our bad, so we need a way. The good news in terms of the gospel is that Jesus made a way by his death and resurrection, and our faith in his finished work reconciles us to the God of the universe. That's the good news. That's Absolutely. the gospel. Absolutely. That's the best news. Uh, yeah. you, you touched on something I want to dig in a little more. And we'll, you, you touched on a few things, but I think the first kind of a, a confusing point is like, there's no work that we can do. It, right. It's by justification. It's by faith alone. Right. Let's dig into that. Clarify that for... Yeah, so faith is a gift, Yeah. so we need to be clear about that because of what I said about the nature of our chosenness mm -hmm. before time began. But uh, I, it's a twofold reality. It's, it's faith and repentance, as we mm -hmm. see in the New Testament. So the Gospels emphasize quite a bit the nature of repentance. If you look at the epistles, they talk more, uh, I think, in depth about the nature of faith and believing, but really those are two sides of the same yeah. coin. They represent the same kind of thing, which is repentance, meaning you're turning away from your godlessness and your ability to save yourself. You're turning away as well from your sin, and you're putting faith in what Jesus has done for you. So, And neither of those things are a work yeah. in the way that Paul defines works in Romans, you know, it's not like, well, I got to do these works, repent and believe. No, they are actions, yes, so that might be uh, a, a minute distinction, but, you know, because the Bible's so clear that we're not saved by works, I, I need mm -hmm. to make that distinction. Yeah. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. We're saved by repentance. Sola gratia, sola fide, you know, by faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone. So repentance and faith is what saves us. Those 
that twofold reality. That's how we're justified. And then we begin this wonderful journey in Christ that you know allows us to continue to be saved, sanctified, made more like Jesus. Of course, not perfectly on this side of eternity. And then we await the future salvation of glorification. Yeah. So how's that? Is that clarifying? It, it's clarifying. Well, I, I want to dig in a little bit more kind of into more of the specifics in the area being in San Antonio and the mission trip that I went on was in South America. There's yeah. a lot of religions that have a very work-based yeah. tying. And some people are relieved when you explain, no, listen, your works can't do it. You're, you, uh, you, I see it in your eyes. You yeah. feel hopeless trying to do that. It's not about the works. And some people accept that. But often a lot will push back and say, well, no, that's not right. You have, look, you have to do this work. You have to do this. Mm -hmm. So what would, what would your, how would you communicate that to someone in Catholicism or another faith-based religion that says we're Christian, I believe in Jesus, but I think these works are what get me there. Yeah, so that's one of the things that honestly differentiates us yeah. as Protestants yeah. from the Catholic tradition. And, you know, Luther, Tyndale, others uh, were appalled by the idea that due penance was yeah. the idea of being justified or, or having faith. It, it's not you repent, you don't do penance. You turn from your own way of saving yourself and turn Absolutely. to Christ ultimately. So in some ways, the, the worldviews and the theological reckonings are, are irreconcilable. Sure. So I, I would steer a person like that to the truth of what I hold to in terms of a Protestant believer. And of course, when I say Protestant, I, I think of myself as a biblicist, somebody who looks at the scriptures and this is what the scriptures say. And the scriptures say that we are justified not by works of the law, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We're, instead, we're justified by faith. We, we, you know, it's not our works, it's the work of Christ right. that saves us. And there's this beautiful theological reality called imputation. Okay. And it has to do with uh, the, a, a grand transference of our sin to Christ on the cross so that he, our sins are imputed to him, he pays for them, them on the cross, and then his righteousness, his status as just before the Lord, is transferred to us, it's imputed to us by faith. So... This is what the book of Romans is all about, the greatest doctrinal treatise ever written. This is what the book of Galatians is about as well, the work that Christ has done that makes us, or more accurately, it renders us as righteous before God in light of what Christ has done for us. So I would be as crystal clear as I could with somebody as I'm yeah. sharing the gospel, especially if they have a background like what you're talking about is, no, it's not about, you know, in your tradition going and, and you know, uh, confessing your sins to the priest in a booth or doing other sacraments or taking the Eucharist, you know, weekly, monthly, whatever, in order to stay saved before God by your good works. That's a perversion of New Testament teaching. No, in, in my understanding, my reckoning, we are saved by grace, by faith alone. Mm -hmm. And we, I mean, we take communion, we don't call it Eucharist, but we don't do that in order to stay saved. We do it because we are saved. We're baptized, as we've yeah. talked about already, not in order to be saved, but because we are saved. Yeah. That act of obedience is an outworking of our faith. It's a, it's a fruit of the faith, in a sense. Absolutely. That's a good yeah. biblical word. Yeah. Uh, so let's, before we move off the work topic, uh, let's, let's put it in its right context then. So as Christians, we're called to do some level of work. It's mm -hmm. a process that takes place after, uh, after salvation going into sanctification is what yep. we're saying is the way we would we would describe it. It's yep. not getting you it's saved, it's because you are saved yes. and wanting to honor and glorify God. Is that simple enough? Yeah, the tail doesn't wag the dog, right? so the dog wags the tail. And, uh, you know, 1 John is has all these wonderful tests mm -hmm. that uh, John gives us about, you know, how we can have confidence and assurance of salvation. And that some of the tests involve walking in the light as he is in the light. Yeah. So, you know, as we're walking in the light, it's like, oh, I'm walking in the light in order to be saved. If you told that to John, he would slap you on both sides <laughs> of your face and say, wake up. No, it's because, maybe you wouldn't, I don't know. But, you know, he, he would say, no, that, that is what Christians do, and you're walking in the light as he is in the light, as you see that transformation taking place. 
by the Holy Spirit inside of you, he would say that too, that that's evidence that you are genuinely saved. Yeah. And so praise God for that. He wants you to know and have that confidence, like I genuinely am saved. Same with the other tests that he used, mm -hmm. the love of the brothers, and uh, just First John is has so many details there, which actually are, are encouraging and affirming. It's like, oh, I am saved. Oh, I yeah. do have that. Oh, I am saved. Boy, I'm not perfect in that, but I'm sure a lot different than I used to be. And that's the evidence of justification. Yeah. Sanctification, that ongoing work, is evidence of justification. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a good turning point there talking about whether or not you can lose your salvation yeah. there. I think there, uh, the water gets a little muddy, gets unclear for some people in that that they hit a point in their life, they become idle, they quote-unquote back, backslide, yep. whatever they would want to call it, where they might look and think, well, I'm no longer saved. I'm not doing this, so I'm not seeing these works. I'm not seeing this fruit, so I'm no longer saved. Is that the case? Yeah, I run across that a lot as yeah. a pastor, and you probably have as well, yeah. just interacting with family members. So the, the clear answer to that question, if I can just put it as crassly as I can, yeah. is no, yeah. you don't lose your salvation. To be honest, you never gained it, but you know, sure. we, won't, <laughs> we yeah. won't parse that right here. Um, and, and the reality of that has to do, for me, with the nature of the Holy Spirit. When you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, you, you are sealed, yeah. as Paul talks about, by the Holy Spirit. You can't get unsealed. Yeah. You know, Jesus talks about the nature of being born again in John 3, and, you know, born again as a reality is framed in the New Testament. You don't once you're born again, you can't be unborn again. It doesn't even make yeah, sense. Yeah. So, no, but here's where this issue does get muddy. I'm less confident, especially now than I used to be, about determining whether or not somebody truly is born again. That's Yes. And that's the issue. We just don't have access yeah. to that information. And I've talked before in preaching, like, I wish I, wish I knew sometimes. I wish there was a, a halo over the people in my church who are saved. <laughs> And no halo, so I was like, oh, okay, well, that right. person's faking it, or that person had a false conversion, or we just don't know. Yeah. And that's, you know, the, the things of the Lord belong to Him, and He determines uh, these things. Absolutely. But we do, we do have fruit, and that's significant. So the passage that I quote often is in John, where John says, they went out from us because they were not of us. They went out from us to show that they were not of us. And it feels very almost primitive, like... Mm you know, how he states it. But that, that helps me to understand those people who deconstruct their faith right. and those people who maybe I had listened to the Christian artists when I was a kid, and now they're like, you know, renouncing Christ and like, once saved, always saved. No, yeah. they were never saved in the first place, obviously, because, you know, you're not going to walk away from the Lord if you're truly, if you're truly committed to Him. So I heard a pastor say this way, perseverance is the the last work of somebody who's truly elect. You will persevere if you're genuinely saved. Right. So somebody who renounces Christ, turns away from Christ, deconstructs their faith, I'm no longer a Christian, I would never go to them and say, well, once saved, always saved. No, they prove themselves an unbeliever by their, their lack of perseverance. And so um, they went out from us yeah. because ultimately they weren't of us. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, we'll come at this from a little bit of a different perspective. I've heard those people that deconstructed their mm -hmm. their faith, that have decided they're not saved, that have just walked away, and some that are living in fear and condemnation because they feel they want to be, but they're concerned that, well, I've messed up and done these things, and I'm not. Mm -hmm. I have also had some people I've gone with to Bible school with long ago approach, and I think we've talked about this uh, off camera probably, people approach and discuss, well, I'm saved now, so I can no longer sin. So they basically have, they feel like it's this check written that I can do whatever I want and live my life as immoral or however I want. I'm saved. It's not going to matter now because I'm saved. <laughs> I was befuddled. Yeah, I was young enough in my faith. I didn't know what to do with that. So that, what would your... Yeah, the, uh, read the Bible. That... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. That just doesn't square. Yeah. So... We've been reading a book in my small group right now called The Whole Christ by Sinclair Ferguson, and he talks about uh, legalism and the dangers inherent in that yeah. as Christians, 
And then also what he calls antinomianism, which is an old word that basically means no law or lawlessness. Yeah. And you know the, the lawlessness side of Christianity has a long history. There were people in Calvin's day and Luther's day who you know, got saved and all of a sudden they become libertines and they go nuts and they, they have sex and they, you know, drink to excess and, you know, and Paul says very clearly way back in the book of Romans, shall I continue to sin so that grace may abound? God forbid, mm -hmm. you know, and so there, there's an aspect of that that's just may, maybe a genuine Christian goes through their antinomian phase and you got to be like, yeah, wake up, wake up. <laughs> what, are, what are you doing? You know, read Romans, read yeah. the New Testament, you know, and... And also, this is a bit metaphysical, but I think it's real. The Holy Spirit who indwells, I mean, he he really packs a punch, Levi. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've experienced this, but <laughs> oh, yes. when you start to go in, into that libertine, antinomianist uh, understanding of the Scriptures, he'll, he'll reel you in. Yeah. And, you know, I've had those experiences in my life where, you know, I start dickering around with sin and the Holy Spirit starts to squeeze and the Holy Spirit starts to convict and the Holy Spirit starts to make me miserable until I conform to the image of Christ mm -hmm. and produce the fruit of the Spirit. So Galatians 5 is clear about, you know, the, the fruit of the flesh, if I want to use that term, and, you know, malice and envy and drunkenness and, and sexual you know, pr promiscuity, all these things, like, that's the flesh, you know, that's not produced by the Spirit. The Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. So, I mean, even Paul is creating there this this duality, like, this is what it means to walk in the Spirit, and this is what a person does who is indwelt by the Spirit, genuinely saved. Not that we're, we're not going to struggle with the flesh, because we, we have this flesh, you know, our sinful nature... Yeah until we get our new bodies. Yeah. So that's going to be a battle. So the whole perfectionism thing is ridiculous too. But you're, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to press and squeeze and coerce and <laughs> and and and, so, and and that might seem kind of harsh, but that's also assurance of salvation. Yeah, exactly. Like, yes. oh yeah, the Holy Spirit is not making me happy in my sin. That's cuz I'm saved. Exactly. And so that's that's further evidence to go back to 1 John that I'm walking in yes. the light as he is in the light. The Holy Spirit is pressing this inside of me. So, uh, yeah, so if somebody, and on the legalism side, you would just help people to see you're not saved by works, so, you know, don't be ridiculously legalistic in the way that you uh, think people should come to Christ or kind of clean up their life before they come to Christ or even after Christ to embrace, I think, all these extra biblical yeah. expectations of yourself. That's where legalism can rear yeah. its ugly head. But you're saved by grace, you're sanctified by grace, and God's goodness is propelling you, not some some sense of I gotta gotta make some rules, you know, and add to what the Bible says in order to please the Lord. Absolutely. Is, it, is this helpful? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm ranting a little bit, but I've been thinking I, I, about I like these it. issues for a lot. And then even in our small group, as we've been processing this, we've been trying to really drill down on you know what what it really means to follow Christ, yeah. show evidence of of a life that's been transformed without you know falling into a yes. workspace yeah. legalism. Absolutely. It's it's you got to have the roadblocks on both sides and it for clar clarity's sake at least. So let's let's kind of step back to like the process per se, the human perspective I guess of the process of of salvation because yes. I mean we know there's like multiple tents to it, but from a human perspective, one of the interesting things that our church does or doesn't do, I guess, in a sense, is we don't have a typical altar call. Yeah. You preach, no matter where we're preaching from the Bible, you make, you find Jesus and you point to that and you point yeah. to the need for the Savior. And I absolutely love that, but we don't end in where a lot of churches do of if you believe Jesus, close your eyes or walk up front. We yeah. don't do that. Is there a heart or a reason specifically why? Well, I, I have done it. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't be opposed to doing that. Uh, on occasion. Um, I remember at five years old, six years old, when I was at Nazarene Christian School in Austin, Texas, a pastor led me yeah. through a prayer. And I see that as the moment when I was, you know, gave my life to Christ, justified, you know, regeneration, I believe, took place before, at least coterminous with that. And then, you know, the fruit of that has been lived out for the last 40 mm -hmm. years in my life. So, so I'm not opposed to it. Um, I, I think we need to be clear about the, the vertical and the horizontal nature of yes. salvation. So let me clarify that. Um, 
I believe that, like I said, with Ephesians 1, 1 Peter 1, uh, we are chosen before the foundations of mm-hmm. the universe, before anything was created. We were chosen before time. So I don't feel this kind of uh, desperate need to get people saved. Yeah. I, I yeah, think yeah. that's a mistake. And you know, or, or to Absolutely. preach a sermon and and feel like, oh, I didn't, you know, I didn't preach the gospel exactly, and, and put enough pressure on the people to respond. Like God's God's going to save who's got God's going to save, so I can sleep easy at night right. about that. Um, but I do have a responsibility and a task to present the nature of the gospel in whatever passage I preach. So yeah. you alluded to that. Spurgeon talks about making a beeline to the cross, no matter where else you are in the scriptures, so that people can understand their need for Christ. And and I agree with that. And so you you present it in the sense of, you know, a call to salvation. Here's how somebody is saved. Repent and believe. Put your faith in Christ. And you, not by coercion or by pressuring or like, hey, you know, Grandma will give you some cookies if you get saved and go get baptized. You know, that that would be shameful to mm-hmm. do something like that. But let's just, let's just talk about it. And so in that, I talked about the vertical and the horizontal plane. What I'm looking for in terms of somebody who comes and wants to get baptized, is is that repentance and faith uh, observable in their life, and can they articulate it? Yeah. So, and and that's tricky with five, six, seven, eight, nine year olds. To be honest, it's even tricky sometimes <laughs> with twenty five year olds. You know, when yeah. did you get saved? Well, I've always been saved. Well, no, you haven't. You know, yeah. I can, let's let's work on that a little bit, and let me help you to understand what justification actually is. So that's that's how I make sense of it, and um, you know if if the the time is right or if there's an opportunity, I've done this when I've done evangelistic events, international or um, even here with VBS and with other things. I've said, hey, if you want to yes. make a decision for Christ today, if you want to give your life to Christ, here's what you do: repent and believe, and just leave it leave it at that without the uh, kind of coaxing. Yes. To a place where uh, I think m- maybe it does get a little melodramatic, and you you can rely curry. on emotion to a degree. Yeah. yeah, and and then you have false converts. Yeah, uh, and we do uh, have people at, up front to come pray yep. with that you that can lead you in that prayer. We we go we, door to door. To door. Yes, we do absolutely. what's called the the three circles with yeah. east west, yeah. and and that is a kind of like altar call. Yes, one on one. Absolutely. You know, no, I don't see a lot of altar calls. Today, yeah. anyway, but uh, uh, so let's talk about the because there is a like a biblical understanding of there's going to be a public profession of your faith at yes. some point. Let's talk about that aspect. If if there's no altar call, because I think that's where a lot of people kind of lined on it is this is your opportunity for that public profession. Yeah, what is that supposed to or what is that going to look like? Well, I mean, the most immediate way in which you you publicly profess scripturally is you you get baptized. <laughs> so, yes, I mean that's what I mean. What better way to tell the world Absolutely. I belong to Jesus? You know, you you get wet, <laughs> yeah. you you symbolize death to life, death to self, and new life that I have in Christ as you go under the water and come out of the water. So, but I mean, it also derives from Jesus's words: If you you know confess me before men, I'll confess yeah. you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'm going to deny you before my Father. So there's no such thing as I'm a secret Christian, right? You know, I don't really talk about it, but I secretly like what, who are you being secret from? You know, this is. Christianity has always been a public recognition of your I- identifying with Christ. So I, I have a real problem yeah. with that. You know, the secret conversions or the secret no. Yeah. You you it's confess. You yeah. and, and even Romans ten nine is probably the passage I use more than anything else when I share the gospel is confess with your mouth. Yep. You gotta talk. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you shall yeah. be saved. I like it. So I'll kind of come, not necessarily full circle, uh, from another perspective. We, I talked at the beginning about how people, you can have a conversation and ask them if they're saved, mm-hmm. and they'll give you this answer, but you, you realize they're off base. And we've talked about the works aspect. What I see more and more nowadays is you can ask them, yeah, yeah, I believe, and then you start digging, and I'll, I've asked people, and I've seen, you see it all over social media, do you believe the Bible? Oh, no, not at all. Absolutely. That's ridiculous. And what they believe is they think that they believe, yeah, there is a God, there's something, it's sure. a way, so I'm good because I've got that covered. Let's draw the hard line in the sand there, like the Bible 
clearly states it's a narrow path. This is the only way to salvation. Amen to that. <laughs> I, I mean, is it Acts 4, 12, there's yes. salvation in no one else for this yes. no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved. So, yeah, and and I, uh, th there needs to be a generosity of spirit for sure. somebody who maybe just got saved, you right. know. Uh, a lot of us in America grow up with some at least understanding of Jesus, about the nature of the Trinity, about, you know, you talked about Catholics. Catholics get a lot of things right, even yeah, though, as absolutely. I said, they get things wrong too. So from that perspective, there might be people that have some understanding. There might be others that they don't, they don't even know what the Bible is, mm -hmm. or they've never even seen a Bible if they've been saved in a foreign country that doesn't have it in their language or isn't easily accessible, if they heard the gospel and they responded in faith. They might not be able to articulate the Trinity yet. They might not be able to, to really you know, hammer out all the, the fine points of the Nicene Creed or uh, other creeds, but, you know, They'll, they'll learn. The Holy Spirit will lead and prompt them, will assure them even of the truth of the Scriptures mm -hmm. over time so that they don't deny it. Um, and so that's, that's how I understand that. And with anybody in that situation where you were talking about, whether it's somebody in a foreign country or here in, in the United States, if they're confused about who God is, I don't affirm their false understanding. Yeah. So I even try to be careful with my body language. To say, If they're saying like, well, I've always been saved, and I believe in God, he or she is up there in, in heaven, and yeah. he's, he or she saves everybody, I don't nod or, you know, kind of with body language, give them a thumbs up. I'll say, hold on a second. Okay. I, that's not true. Yeah. Do you, Here's what I believe. Or maybe that's not true is to you know, confrontational. You can just say, wait a second, that's not what I believe. Here's what I understand from Scripture and walk them through the gospel. So I think that's important. Yeah. We, I know we live in a day where, you know, disagreement's tough and everybody's online kind of trying to blow everybody else out of the water. <laughs> um, I'm not advocating for that or for, for sure. being unnecessarily confrontational, but some, some things are worth being confrontational about, and yeah. that's one of those things where you don't have to be obnoxious or, or insult somebody, but just say, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with the way that you just presented the gospel. Here's how I understand the gospel and mm -hmm. walk them through it. Mm -hmm. And I, w I would say kind of having think it through this from a believer's perspective when you're talking to or looking at these scenarios is it really should change the approach of the conversation. It shouldn't change your outlook toward them or how you treat them per se, but yeah. what are my talking points? Am I talking to someone that just needs to understand sanctification, and that is not work-based, or do we need to step back and talk about what is salvation and have you really hit that mark? I would think that that'd be the only thing that needed to change there. Yeah, I'm all for dialogue. I'm mm -hmm. all for conversation. And, and even, you know, if I was talking with a Muslim, like, Probably at the end of the conversation, we're not going to agree. Sure. He's going to say salvation is this, and I'm going to say it's that. But at least he's clear about what right. I believe the scriptures teach. There's not like some forced or inauthentic. Yeah, we we agree with each other. We just say it differently. No, you don't. Yeah, <laughs> you don't agree. And and actually, a Muslim's going to think less of you if you did say, For sure. you know, because he doesn't think that. Yeah. He's going to say, "Well, I disagree with you." Okay, let's agree to disagree, but it, let's at least be clear about our our differences in terms of the religious convictions that we have. Yeah, absolutely. As we wrap up, you have any final thoughts? This is important. This might be the most yeah. important thing we've ever absolutely. talked about, Levi. And uh, we, the gospel is good, and it's clear, and it's wonderful. It's worth, you know, spending the time to articulate clearly, to be able to say in a 30-second elevator pitch, here's how you put yeah. your faith in Christ. Did you know, you know, or on the airplane or, or you know, in a water cooler conversation, if people still do that in the office space, you know, hey, did you know that Jesus Christ came to this earth and he died on a cross for our sins, and I believe that my faith in his death and resurrection saves me, and I can live eternally with him. I mean, I don't know if that was 30 seconds. That might have been less. less yeah. Like, work on that so that you can, you know, get what the most important thing that you believe down to something that you can articulate in, in a flash. 
And then if if there's an opportunity to have coffee with them, and yeah. let me unpack that a little bit. Let's look up some verses. Let's see what Paul says in Romans 3.23 and 6.23 and 10.9 and 10, and walk them through some things even better. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, thank you for the time. We're going to wrap it up here, I believe. If you are at home, and maybe something we said today did spark that. He just gave the 15 second, 20 second elevator uh, salvation pitch there. If that struck home and you're coming to that realization for the first time, I'd encourage you to find a good, healthy Bible believing church in your neighborhood. If you're here in San Antonio or you are connected verse by verse, reach out to us. Go to bbbf.org. We've got emails, we've got all of our teachings online. Uh, if you are a believer and you haven't taken that next step that we've talked about, baptism. I encourage you. We just recently did a video on baptism. You can check that out. Take that next step. Let people know. Publicly proclaim. That's it, It's what it's all about, and it is, as he said, the most important thing we've talked about thus far. Until next time, God bless.